my name is Dan Porgy, I'm from Gettysburg, South Dakota, and, and I've been with Cronin Farms for uh, 40 years, and, and uh, it's been an enjoyable 40 years. Uh, basically, I'm the agronomy manager of the farm, and we're a quite diversified farm with cow-calf operation, and we're uh, about a 9,000 acre uh, farm, and we're 100% we're, uh, no-till, and have been for 17 years. Bringing the people behind our food to life. No-till agriculture is, is non-disturbance of the soil. And that's our big goal is we never try to turn the soil. We always want to leave the soil. We want to leave the armor on the soil. And every time you turn the soil, you, you release the carbon. And carbon is a very important factor in making organic matters. So this is basically spring wheat rotation. And you can see the remnants if you look. This was sunflowers last year. You can see the sunflower stalks. It was corn before that. You can find the corn in corn stalks or corn cobs. Here's a, here's a piece of corn cob. From, uh, so you can see there's quite a bit of history in the ground on the cover crop and all that residue stays on top and basically it's a soil armor. It acts as a protection so the moisture doesn't evaporate. And then another thing is all that residue breaks down and causes organic matter. And the, the, it takes the residue plus the carbon to make organic matter. In the olden days, and when they first started to farm, they were finding out they were getting really tremendous crops with, without using any fertilizer. And uh, the reason they were is because this country used to be 5 to 6 percent organic matter. Well, through the tillage years, we were getting down to where we were down to like 1 percent, 1.2 percent, 2 percent organic matter. And uh, they were, then, they, then that's when the fertilizer first came into play. And so people were trying to uh, do it by f using man-made fertilizer instead of the organic matter. It took us a long time to destroy that organic matter. But in, in the last 10 years, we've gained 1.2% uh, in organic matter. And that's huge because uh, 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 to, if you can gain a tenth of a percent a year, that's just huge. And basically what we're trying to do is speed up the process of building organic matter by putting cover crops in our rotation. We'd been no-tilling uh, uh, for 14 years, and we were always looking for that extra little, little uh, step to help speed up soil health. And uh, we heard Dwayne Beck talk a lot about cover crops and the benefit. And that first fall, we went and we planted 100 acres, and we used, uh, we used uh, lentils and canola, and, and, uh, and they turned out all right. We were doing it, but we really didn't know why, and there's a lot of questions to be asked. The next year we applied for a SARE grant and we received it. And it was a big plot, a 60 acre plot. There's uh, six replications of different kinds of cover crop, along with a check strip with no cover crop. You know, and I knew it was more than I could handle and they were more than willing to help. I had Shannon Osborne from the ARS out of Brookings and Dwayne Beck from Dakota Lakes helped me with this plot and helped me set up the what varieties we plant, and then also all the soil sampling. We went in the next year, and on these strips we, uh, we planted the corn and we left uh, strips with no fertilizer on them. And uh, so we could actually see what cover crops basically benefited us the most. And, uh, and it was really a long, long study and a good study. And, based, and we found out uh, uh, that we could still raise uh, pretty good corn with uh, especially behind our lentils and, and, and canola. And uh, so basically the lentils were really uh, adding a lot of nitrogen to the soil. And then uh, the, the canola was probably helped breaking down the, the residue a little faster and speeding up our organic matter. Three years after that, we're doing a lot of uh, uh, mixes, different mixes, different things. Uh, do I really know where we want to be for sure? No. Do I, I, I know the cover crop mixes that we want in? Yes, I do. And a lot of that was answered on our Sarah Grant plot. 
we'll start with winter wheat. So you're going to have winter wheat, you just get done with harvest. So then you're going to turn around and, and you plant your cover crop behind your winter wheat. We'll plant them about the 15th of August and there's a lot of different cover crops to use. So like right, so like right here is the, we've got lentils and it'll fix nitrogen. So that'll actually get nodules on it like an alfalfa, like a, a soybean, so they fix nitrogen. And then, uh, then you've got a, you've got a, a, this is a radish and that's a brassica. Basically a brassica is just a, a big leaf and all it does is it, it, it's really good at drawing carbon. And then also like brassicas usually have big tap roots like the radishes, the turnips, the, the canolas, and, and so they break compaction. And so they'll actually go down in the soil and they'll break compaction. And then the, the oats is a really a high fibrous, usually it's a really good grazing, they'll usually get quite a bit taller. It's a high fibrous root, it's really good for the, for the, the soil. So your cover crop grows up and it gets tall and it cycles the nitrogen. And then you're going to come in and you're going to plant corn into that winter wheat stubble. So you're going to have your foot high, 16 inch tall winter wheat stubble and you're going to plant your corn right into it. Just So when you get done planting your corn, it looks like a stubble field. And then you're going to get the benefits from your cover crop, uh, you know, because it, it cycled the nitrogen and, you, and it might have fixed some, some nitrogen. And so then when you get done harvesting your corn, you're going to leave all your corn stalks stand. You're not going to let anything happen to them. You're going to come in and you're either going to plant soybeans or sunflowers. So let's say we plant sunflowers. So what you do is you go right in between the row and you plant your sunflowers. So when you come out to a sunflower field when they're just coming up, they're going to be four or five inches tall and there's going to be corn residue all around and there's going to be corn stalks standing up and here's them little sunflower plants. And so that's fine. You go through and you make that whole cycle and you go through the sunflower growth stage and then you harvest your sunflowers so that you harvest them in the fall, then the next spring you'll come in and you'll plant a spring wheat. This is just one of the rotations. It's a never ending cycle and, and it's just a lot of pieces to the puzzle. And the big thing is, is to get that cover crop in that cycle. The longer you stay in no-till, the better off you are because the, the, there's something about when you get over that six or seven years into it, you see a, something happening to your ground, and you, but when you get 10 years into it, you really start to see it. And I think people that are starting off no-till, when they get four or five years into it, if they had put cover crop into their rotation, I think they'd jump ahead two or three years. I know the cold is, is hurt a lot, but you can see the aggregation in our soil. You can see the root mass in our soil. I mean, that's just unreal, but the aggregation will help the uh, the water infiltration, aggregation, what that means is just that the, it, it makes a more fibrous soil. So the, the soil isn't, uh, isn't really stuck together, it just kind of breaks up and it crumbles. But look at that soil, that's just unreal. Before we started uh, the no-till with the cover crops, uh, You'd, uh, there'd be very little aggregation or no aggregation. It'd basically, basically be, be just a, a hard slab. Uh, but I just, I just think that's tremendous, you guys, to have that, that amount of, of roots growing in the ground because basically what you're doing is you're feeding the soil. The microorganisms, they, I mean, if you, didn't, if, we, if you don't plant a cover crop, what happens? If you don't plant a cover crop, then the microorganisms, they basically don't have anything to eat. And, and when they eat, they get happy and then they, they help break things down. And all we're trying to do is in, in, increase uh, the, the amount of, uh, of organic matter we have. And, and, the, the, and by feeding the soil, that's how you do it. We're really seeing the benefit in a cash crop following cover crop. We're getting a lot healthier crops uh, and we're getting more, more yield. So these are grain bins. So what we do is is we'll haul, we'll put all our crops in these bins. We've got another bin site uh, farther south. We haven't really grown in size. We've grown a little bit, but not very much. And we just uh, put up a 240,000 bushel storage and a grain handling system. And basically we haven't acquired any more land. It's just that we're raising that much more crop. And now we're finding out with no-till there's really a balance. We can cut back on 
man-made fertilizer and we can uh, uh, and, and use the benefit of the, of the organic matter from the no-till farming to replace the man-made fertilizer. The, the people with livestock have, have a tremendous use for cover crop. I mean, I think grazing cover crop in the fall is just, uh, uh, as far as uh, for compaction, the radishes, the, the tubers when they go on the ground, uh, the, the cows will eat the top off, they will not be able to pull them out. That tuber will stay there, it basically stops compaction, the, the cattle love them, the cattle do great on them. It's good for the ground, it's good for the cattle, the, the cattle are actually out there grazing instead of you hauling feed to the cows, the cows are going out for the, to eat the feed and then they're all, actually leaving all the manure in the field and that's just, that's a win-win situation. The only disadvantage that there probably be is, is we're going to run into that dry year some year where you plant your cover crop in the fall and then we turn into where instead of having 18 and a half inches of rain, we have 12 inches. And then you go into that next year and you don't get replenished with that two inches of water that cover crop took out. And that's the only disadvantage, but in the long run, I think it's, it's well worth the gamble because uh, you're, the benefits to cover crop are, are, gonna, uh, are gonna outweigh that one year that you're, you might be in that situation. I spend a tremendous amount of time uh, investigating things before we go into them. If a guy is going to get into cover crops, talk to the people that are growing them. And you have to find out what uh, is best for your land or talk to somebody that uses it that is close to you and find out what they're doing and go from there. And that's, that's another benefit of the SARE grant because there's a lot of questions answered on that SARE grant and that for a lot of different people on what crops to use and what cover crops to use. And a lot of times when someone has a cover crop question, I'll email them all the links I've got. I've got a whole little packet, and then it also will be that, that book of Managing Cover Crop Profitability Edition 3. I've got it on PDF on my computer. You know, just like right here in the forward here, cover crop, slow erosion, improve soil, smother weeds, enhance nutrient. I mean, this is a... This is where you want to go. I mean, if anybody's, anybody that's talking cover crop, I forward this to them. If you forward this to them, they've got the copy. If you say, well, you can go buy this someplace, they're not going to do it. So I, I really, I think this is a tremendous book. I really do. I really believe in the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and I don't believe in overusing it. And I believe that uh, for sustainable agriculture that we have to, for farming for our grandkids, that we have to pay attention to what we're doing. And we're not, and if you don't need it, you don't use it. And there's a lot of things that uh, the, the ground's willing to work for us and, and to learn to let it work for you but not abuse it. I think that's just a tremendous thing. And I think that that's where all this is going with the no-till and cover crop is we're basically going to let the ground work for us like it wants to work for us, just like it did back when this was native pasture. This video has been made possible with funding from Sustainable Agriculture, Research, and Education, SARE.